Um, so uh, we're very excited today to uh, have some of the biggest names in the industry here to, to talk about what's going on in the private lending business. We have uh, John Beecham, the CEO of Torac, which is one of the largest aggregators in the in the private lending space. We have John Hornig with Private Lender Law, who's uh, one of the uh, one of the key attorneys, one of the, the key voices in the private lending legal space. And we have Kevin Kim from Jurassi, who is uh, likewise one of the, the leading voices in the private lending legal space. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump right into the, the questions. Uh, so uh, Mr. Beecham, John, let's uh, start with you. So uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the prospect of uh, additional consolidation in the private lending space this coming year? Uh, well, I think it's important to say a lot of it's already happened, right? So I think we've had a unprecedented wave of M&A activity um, in the space over the past year. Um, deals that come to mind, you know, Anchor uh, transacted, uh, Genesis uh, sold for, for the second time, uh, Lima transaction transacted, um, I think there's a number of others that are uh, less public um, that have also happened uh, to various parties. So there's already been a significant amount of consolidation in the space. And, you know, I think the, uh, that will likely continue to the extent there's more companies available out there to be purchased. Um, clearly right now, volumes are generally up for the industry. Uh, the market has had a very good year. We're coming off a record year in the private lending industry. Um, and so a lot of people are looking for ways to, uh, to exit. Really, the, the drivers of that, I think, are really a lot of the institutionalization of the market that's happened over the past year and a half. I saw just this morning, actually, like Anchor announced that they're uh, doing a securitization or they posted their preliminary documents on the SEC website indicating they're about securitized. Um, and so what's happening is that you've seen a pretty significant compression of capital uh, cost in the industry uh, through TORAC and other, and other dynamics generally under the rubric of institutionalization. And you know the lenders that have access to good quality financing um, are you know becoming the winners, and lenders that don't have access to that kind of financing are becoming the losers. So that's driven a lot of this consolidation. It's actually driven a lot of our success. We partner with lenders all over the country uh, that we can provide uh, you know very low cost capital to to allow them to grow their business. And I think that's going to continue to be a theme over the course of this year, and frankly, you know, going forward, this industry has historically been very, very fragmented um, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of participants all over the country, you know, much more fragmented than other parts of the mortgage industry. Um, you know, residential mortgages are much more concentrated uh, than the private lending industry. Uh, commercial real estate is certainly much more concentrated than the private lending industry. So in a lot of ways, what's happening is kind of catching up this industry uh, to the rest of the mortgage space, um, which has already been uh, more consolidated than this industry has. Well said. Um, uh, so John Hornick, um, I'll, I'll throw the same question over to you. So uh, in terms of con consolidation, what do you see happening in the industry? So what I'm seeing is there's a lot of institutional money that wants to be in the space and can't figure out a way to get in. And I'm going to separate table funders, originators, and aggregators. They, you can't all wear the same hat and it's different business for each. And I think that's where uh, the industry has matured, that it's learned that if you want to be an aggregator, it's not easy to be a table funder or an originator. And if you want to be an originator or a uh, table funder, it's not easy to be an aggregator. It's a different level of due diligence and, and execution expertise that's necessary for both operations. So what's happened is people who want to be on the table funding or originator side have said, okay, I'm going to go out and buy a smaller originator and then build them up. Now, the metrics for targets in our space are everybody wants to be at a billion dollars a year in terms of generation. And you don't necessarily have to be at a billion to be bought, but you have to have the platform and the foundation to be able to scale up. And that's what people are looking for in our space. So I think that the consolidation in terms of the originators and the, and the table funders will continue. The aggregators 
are, are not going to be, there are people who announce they're in the space and they want to start buying loans, but the only ones who make it are the ones who execute and deliver week after week, like Torac does. So that so it's one thing to have money. Everybody has money. I had some very big real estate outfits call me recently and said, we want to be in your industry. And I said, well, what do you got? Well, we got a lot of money. I go, so does everybody else. That's not a something that's going to get you to the table. You need clear execution, which is where all this consolidation is coming from. We, we live in a world that is in expertise. This is not like any, this isn't agency or non-conforming loans. In fact, I think most people that switch over from the agency world don't succeed in this space. It's hard to undo what they know. I'd rather take someone from the commercial world and teach them the rules and regulations in our space than take somebody from the agency world and try to undo them. But that's that it's it's a hard thing. So if you have a originator that has certain expertise in in originating business purpose bridge and DSCR loans, then they have an expertise, a special sauce that someone wants to buy. Put them up, put them with a good scalable product and they're a target. So I think it's going to continue. I don't think it's over right now. Uh, subject to some macro things changing, which we could talk about in a little bit. Um, I think I look at it's a it's a really good point to kind of just differentiate between the the various between aggregators, table funders, and originators, and and say how consolidation is going to affect each. Um, and, and also, like at the end of the day, there's so much capital flowing in that. We're going to see consolidation, in my opinion, across all three of those, like larger institutions, um, the, the Black Rocks of the world are going to buy up bigger aggregators, in my opinion, um, and so on and so forth down the chain. But I, I suppose see this, I see the ex, I see the targets as the originators and the table funders. I don't see it as the aggregators. I think the ag, I think John. John Beecham is an aggregator and his partner's KKR. And if anybody big wants to come to John Beecham, he can do business with them or not. It's up to him. I, I think the aggregators that know what they're doing could always find money and trade and securitize. But the key is not a big company. It's the ability to tap the securitization markets because that's the cheapest money. And we're all chasing the cheapest money. And so uh, if, you know, John mentioned anchors doing their first securitization, right? That, that or, or just filing for one. That's big for them because that means they are tapping a pool of cheaper money. And that's where the chase is in this game. Get to the cheapest money. And the cheapest money is always through a securitization, perhaps an insurance company or you know, a, life, a life company that doesn't need uh, a big rate. But uh, that's where you want to be. And the firms that do that directly are the ones that are going to be successful. Yeah, guys, I think one of the things that we're overlooking also is, is the popularity of the local originator at uh, as a target for your national uh, retail origination shops, right? It's it's a conversation that I have constantly. We're we are we are buyers now, like we are buyers. We need to we want to acquire a local origination shop, and I think that conversation is a lot harder of a conversation to have, right? It's it's easier for us to kind of see from our perspective and see the the Predium transactions and the the Redwood transactions, and that makes sense, right? But when you look at the and it's primarily a financial move. When you look at the when you look at the consolidation happening at the retail level, one thing that we have to think about is is beyond beyond financials and beyond cost of capital. It's now we have to think about acquiring an operation, an entrepreneur, a CEO of his own company coming yeah. to fly my flag, and that becomes an even more challenging conversation. I think it's going to happen, but I think it's you have to like, like our our listeners should be thinking about like if I'm interested in selling my company, really have to have to think about am I comfortable either working for somebody else or, or do I want to really walk away? And that may change the valuation of the sale. Yeah. So and it's a really interesting a lot conversation of these, there. No, that's right, Kevin. And, and on the smaller originator side, a lot of these originators, there's not a lot there, there. I mean, they're right. the, the CEO provider. is the, pretty much the value right there. And so. so the challenge in all these kind of small acquisitions is you sort of pay the owner of the small originator money. Uh, you know, what's it cause them to keep working hard and actually yeah. in the future. And so, you know, the companies that are really successful actually have, um, you know, multiple layers of management, right? It's not, it's not one person who's sort of driving it. It's uh, right. a real team. There's a depth of management. There's diversity of, uh, 
diversity of responsibilities across the organization and there's no key man risk. And the more, you know, originator, if I was originator, the more I'd get myself towards that model, ironically, which is so, so kind of intuitive because you're in some ways you're trying to replace yourself or make yourself redundant. Right. And but a lot of you're folks not, you're not as important as you think you are. <laughs> yeah. But it makes you more valuable, right? It does. For it a, does. A partner. Yeah. Uh, m most of the deals we structure on mergers and buyouts require key management to one get their money over time based on milestones that are achieved. If you say your you know your revenue is X, you got to do X plus year after year, and and there's a certain amount of the purchase price held in escrow, which which moves based on the fact of the company actually performing where it's supposed to be. And the second is of course. Uh, the, the key employees have to sign on and run the business and transition the business if that's requested. And the final is a non-competition close. You can't go out after this is sold and start 2.0 of the same company to bring back all or, you know, and non-solicitation that you can't just start uh, you know, 2.0 and, and build a better mousetrap. So all those are key parts. And that's what people have to understand. This isn't in industry where you, like other businesses, where you sell, you get your money and you walk away. That doesn't happen. This is a buying in to an operation that still has to perform, grow, and you still have to work. So if you're thinking, if you're getting of the age that you're thinking of retiring and stepping away, you have to plan for that over a three to five year period. That's not something that happens like that overnight. Yeah, I think that's entirely right. Um, when when a larger company comes in, they want to see the, the the key members on for another three years at least, and they have those lockout periods to ensure that the the, the key talent is uh, staying within. Right. It's really, but I, I've had many a conversation with like you know principal founder type person who's like, man, you know, the more and more I think about this, I don't like the idea of having a boss. And so that's, that's, that's like beyond, beyond valuation, beyond any kind of key terms you can draft in. It's, it, it's almost like a cultural thing. Like, do, do I really want to go work for X, Y, Z company now? Right. And of granted, of course, like a lot of these negotiations will end up with that seller having a pretty big or some substantial seat at the table um, with some type of C-suite position, but sometimes it's not. And that, and that, and that becomes a challenge for them. Um, and, and it can be a, uh, what I would call a deal breaker for a lot of these uh, private lenders who, who are entrepreneurs and love being an entrepreneur. So well, I would say most of the people who run the originators in our, in our space are entrepreneurs. Oh, yeah. And, and, and by the way, that's where the opportunity is, right? They're different. They're different personalities. Some of them have big personalities. They're different by region. You can look at the people in the South. They're different from the people from the California and New York. I mean, it, it, and it's awesome. That's what I like about the space, right? It has character, it has color, and, and, and no, they don't fit into the corporate world that easily. And that's okay. That's what creates this opportunity for all of us, you know? And, and the fact that the institutional world has discovered our space and, and has put their flag in it and wanna stay in it is a cool thing, but it, it makes jobs for us and, and Kevin's firm and, and John, where we take the Wild West and we convert it into something that Wall Street wants. We make it institutional. And that's really the opportunity. And, and that's what's awesome about it. I don't want that to change. I don't want it to become too institutional. It might. <laughs> I think, I think, Look, that, I think it's not a bad I, thing. I, I think that bad. ship has already sailed, Mr. Warner. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think I think we're fighting this, and it goes to another question. I don't know if you want to do these in order, but what are your thoughts on government regulation in the private lending space? Mm. Fight it around the country with the you know the National Private Lenders Association and and other associations that are all involved in it. It's the worst thing in the world that could happen. This is these are business terms between two part two parties, and it gets negotiated, and, and everybody's of equal equal par, and that's the way our country's built. That's the way business gets done. The minute the government starts getting involved and saying this person needs more protection and the lender needs a license to participate, and we have to watch disclosures, that's when transactions slow down, and that makes it actually easier for other people to enter the space because only the very wealthy can then comply. And it's going to limit all these originators who are, who are, you know, out hustling, who are entrepreneurs, 
And, you know, I'm, I'm 100% against that. And that's, that's what I hope we don't go to. And that's why we all have to be diligent when, when we're fighting this stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's a great segue. Um, so, Kevin, I, I'll throw that same question over to you. Like, what mm -hmm. are your government regulation and how that's going to affect the industry? Yeah, I mean, the primary concerns that we're always watching are like, you know, it's kind of twofold, right? You've got actual state legislation that we are very concerned about from a, like, primarily licensing, right? One of the big things we watch for is licensing. Are you currently in a state that you're exempt in and all of a sudden the state's going to make you become licensed? Like, we don't, you know, we don't want... You know, like Texas lenders don't want to have to go through all the red tape that we in California have to or even worse in Arizona. Right. So going through those type, uh, making sure they were staying, staying vigilant and, you know, I'm part of NEMA and our friends over at APL, like we're like watching this on a, on a daily basis. We have a key key sided and we're watching this because at the end of the day, if this start, if this becomes a trend and we start seeing more and more states adopting these licensing regimes, it, it becomes just overly burdensome to enter the market, right? And we all want the same thing for the, for the industries. We want it to grow. So that's the number one thing that we're always watching out for. I don't necessarily know if there's anything in the immediate future. I mean, Florida is always in the conversation, right? Florida is always going to be there. You're always going to have people trying to get new licensing legislation in Florida. And I know for a fact, Nima's going to fly down again and fight that for us if we have to. Um, but you know, other, other issues that we face are more rulemaking. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's also, you know, federal legislation, the Build Back Better Act, which we were fighting last year, particularly those two code sections, but that's really more on the capital side, protecting our IRA investor clients and our IRA investor friends to be able to freely invest in the sector, right? And so, <clears throat> and in real estate at large. And so that was important, right? And we're really happy that we got behind that and fought that. Um, you know, the whole campaign last year about hashtag save reg D, right? So that was really great. But on the flip side, there's also rulemaking stuff that we have to watch out for that can be really detrimental that's not oftentimes watched. And a lot of this stuff is like CFPB rulemaking, uh, SEC rulemaking. And this is not, as I mean, we, this is all in the news, right? Like, like OSHA's, OSHA's mandate with the vaccines, that, that's a rulemaking policy, right? So you're not seeing legislation being proposed by Congress or, or, or a state legislature you're seeing a government agency write up rules that may really detriment, detriment our businesses. For example, this is very early stages, right? The SEC is now kind of like contemplating this concept of making large scale private companies be more transparent. What the hell does that mean, right? And if when we see the rules come out, we'll definitely oppose it. But like, this is something that is oftentimes overlooked and, make, and we have to make sure we're constantly thinking about that as well, because the the administrative agencies that have a lot of this authority yep. can really hurt us. And we have to watch that as well. I think it's, it's important. This is why, you know, we're, I mean, at, at, at our, at our firm, we're basically talking on a weekly basis. Cause like, is this new thing going to be a threat? Is that new thing going to be a threat? Are we going to be collateral damage right to this particular, like the whole build back better act thing is like, we weren't directly, I mean, the taxes. Yeah. But we weren't directly affected by our industry. We were directly affected by it, but we were collateral <laughs> damage by a lot of that legislation. Right. Tax rules going, taxes going up, whatever. Right? That's that's part of having a Democrat in office. But but the 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 IRA rules, right? It wasn't a direct attempt to regulate mortgage, the mortgage industry, but we were gonna be collateral damage of it. And our, our fund managers and our, our clients and our real estate borrowers, our borrowers were gonna be collateral damage of this legislation. So that's how we have to make sure we're thinking is not just is it gonna be on the nose legislation that's really gonna that's really high profile, but is there trickle down collateral impact on our industry or people that we serve? Yep. Uh, and, and how do we fight that? So, so that's, different, that's how different, we obviously it. different levels of the government we have to be concerned about the stuff that's going on the agency and the rulemaking is, of course, important. What I believe is more important is the state legislatures who are trying to make names for themselves that directly. Affect our businesses. I'll give you an example. There's two pending statutes in New York. One requires a doubling of a transfer tax. It's called the fix and flip tax. If you buy and sell a one to four family, it's 50% of the profit goes as transfer tax. Okay, That wipes out the fix and flip business in New York. From years month two, 12 to 24, if you buy something, fix it up and sell it between month 12 and 24, it's 25% of the profit. That also wipes it out. Okay, this is something that came forth. There's also discussion about requiring private lenders to be licensed in New York now. 
Now, we fought that last year with the NPLA, and we got an exemption for mortgages, uh, mortgage loans, loans secured by mortgages. So it was carved out. Real estate in New York is a very heavy regulated business already. Now, let's just dial back why this is happening. I am a, an elected official in New Jersey. I'm on the local level. I've been a mayor for 16 years. I interact with the governor of New Jersey, state, a state senators and assembly people on a daily basis. They're not so smart. They do not know our space. So what Kevin's talking about and what we're doing and what the NPLA is doing is we have to give testimony and educate. We have to give comments when pending bills come out because all elected officials want to do is pass law to try to get good press or try and get reelected. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, and it's unfortunate. And they and I want to tell you something. If you want to screw something up, give it to the government. They will find a way to screw it up. There's no reason to be passing all these laws, rules and restrictions. Most of the time, the restrictions are already on the books. They just aren't enforcing them. So that's a different discussion. But what we need to monitor very carefully, both Apple, both MPLA, both the Rossi firm, private lender law, and everybody else in the space, is we have to monitor the state laws that are trying to regulate what we do on a daily basis. That's where the licensing structure comes in, and that's where we have to remain active. And, and just for the record, there's nobody worse than the California legislature and the restrictions that they put in in that place. I mean, they think that they're passing laws and rules that that there is, they are so blue right now as a state that that it's making you know New York look red, which is unbelievable in itself. That somebody's got to get a hold over there because it's it's the biggest economy in our country and and it's dangerous for our space. And I'm an elected Democrat, by the way. I'll tell you <laughs> so the record. So I can what do, say what do, that. I so what do you really like think, that. John? <laughs> no, but I, I listen. We spent a lot of time on on this, but it's it's obviously an important issue. I really wanted to. Thank actually Tarasi and Private Lender Law, Apple and the MPLA, you know, being vigilant about this and, and defending the interests of the industry is something that's really important. I know there's a lot of work. These guys don't get paid for this. It's it's kind of for the benefit of the industry and something we should all be appreciative of and thank them for. So thank you guys. You're welcome, John. Oh, sweet John. Thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> I think so, John, to your point, like. Yeah, I think the state versus federal distinction is key. And I think that with particular states that have uh, restrictions and are passing a more restrictive legislation in place, that the market's going to flow away, business is going to flow away from those states. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. So what, what I, there is an entire industry called the residential lending industry, okay, that none of the people on the phone probably work in. <laughs> The, the, if you talk to those companies, a significant portion of their staff are compliance, regulatory driven human. Yeah. I mean, their entire organizations are set up to comply with a myriad list of long, sometimes hard to understand, confusing and complicated roles. Once you've set that up, okay, then it's easy to have, you know, that not easy, easier for them, certainly than all the people on this phone who don't have that to go and adapt that to a different regulatory regime and offer new products within that world. The, the problem is for the private lending industry, the customers in this business don't want to wait three months to get their loan, right? I just got a home loan last year. It took me three months to close my loan, literally like me. And, and it took, takes forever to get your home loan closed. They need the money quick. They need it fast. They need it reliable. They need to be able to deal with the lender they can deal with on a commercial basis and close really efficiently. And so the reality of that is really detrimental to the underlying business rationale of our industry, um, but also really hurtful to a lot of people, you know, who don't have that set up internally. So it's going to be, you know, that all the people on this call are going to not be doing this anymore and someone else will be doing this. So I don't, I think the borrowers will be disserviced by moving towards the regulatory regime, uh, certainly at a state level. But I also think the, um, you know, the real winners end up being the big companies that you know, already have, you know, hundreds, some cases, thousands of regulatory compliance people on staff yeah. who just spend their entire lives kind of doing this. So I, I disagree. With, I agree with John in his, um, in his analysis on, on who would dominate the market if we become more regulated. I did, this, if your question goes to which states you'd avoid right now, it's the ones that are over-regulating as they are. So, there's, so let, let's look at New York, for example. New York finally risked, lifted its foreclosure moratorium. 
Uh, New, uh, California has not. I know there are a couple cities who specifically are extending local ones. This is hurting our business. And it's not about throwing people out. It's the natural lifeline of a loan. The way it should work is a lender meets a borrower, a borrower requests a loan, a loan is underwritten, terms are agreed, the money is given, interest is paid, the loan is paid back. If the loan is not paid back, the lender has to be able to exercise remedies, which is foreclosure and eviction. The more the states interfere with the natural process of the loan, the less business friendly that state is, the more it should be avoided by people because you can't, because time is money. John doesn't want defaulted loans in his securitizations or on his books. So, so what has to happen is that you, what's going to happen is the states that allow for a quick remedy, if the bar doesn't do what he's supposed to do, are the states that are going to keep growing. Which states are those? Florida, Texas. These states are going to keep booming because you can get to the properties when it's required. You know how hard it is to do? We have a, for, a nationwide foreclosure loss mitigation group at Private Lender Law. We handle foreclosures, uh, forbearance all over the country. You know how hard it is to execute one in one of the blue states? It's a disaster right now. And, 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 it's, and people are waiting and we're pushing it every way we can, but the judges don't want to hear it. It's not what you want. You want to get something foreclosed on Florida? Piece of cake. And therefore people are either going to pay or not pay. It's a better place to be lending right now. So to answer the question, that I think you were answering, stay away from the red states, uh, the blue states, participate in the red states as much as you can, at least until we get to uh, equilibrium where things are back to normal. You know, but John, one, of the, one of the fascinating parts about that is like, you know, certain red states, at least we're up, like in the Southwest here, like California is clearly a blue state, right? We are the bluest of blue, right? But you have purple and blue states, uh, red states like, you know, uh, Arizona and Nevada, which are super restrictive, right? They, at least yeah. to get into the state. Uh, and we call, I call it the big three, right? California, Arizona, Nevada, right? Arizona, Arizona, Nevada are probably the worst states to get licensed in. But like, fascinatingly enough, we've, you know, we've done more like Arizona license applications than ever before. And, and we're starting to pick, I have pick up on Nevada and like, People are starting to say, you know what, I'm going to bite the bullet and get licensed over there because there's opportunity in these states. It's very interesting to me because what you say, uh, and I'm, I'm part of the uh, Arizona Private Lenders Association, and like it's a very small, tight knit group, right? And, and it's a very local group. But the number of applicants that are going into the state because they see the opportunity, even though they know it's, man, it's going to be tough to operate here. We're going to have the regulators under our hood all the time, especially like states like Nevada. It's it's it, a lot of people are saying it's worth it. Um, and, but and the foreclosure rules and the, those foreclosure, foreclosure rules are actually remarkably that, friendly. In I'm those speaking states. totally of foreclosure. You could get to the property. Yeah, I don't mind them having. But you know what, what? Also on the data side, though, we have. I, I mean, I, we. I was sitting now with Nima the other day, and we were running through our data and and look, realizing, like, wait a minute. The interesting part about this is like, we're seeing an increase in states that are really hard to foreclose in. Like one of the states that we saw a big increase in. Massachusetts. We all know how bad Massachusetts can be, right? So it's interesting um, because I agree with you. Like, it's like I would love it if every state was like Texas, where you can foreclose in 30 days and be out, right? I love it. But the reality of the marketplace is like people are looking for opportunity and they're doing what they can to get it. And the fact that Massachusetts is a growing market and other states like, you know, North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, not famous for being easy to foreclose in are growing. And, and I think we can't deny, deny the fact that people are from a volume perspective, they're looking at new up new States for opportunity. So like, <clears throat> and they're going to bite the bullet they have to bite the bullet because where else are they going to go? And then another point is like, another thing that's overlooked at the Midwest, right? Midwest, all judicial, very complicated to foreclose in, but highly underserved market market compared to the coastal coastal marketplace. Right. I mean, John, you, John Beach, you tell me like, you know, there's a lot of increase in the Midwest. Attention is being headed toward the Midwest. Right. And so, I, 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 I agree that like, it's really hard to foreclose, but I think our lenders are saying we, we really need to uh, uh, expand our footprint and, and take it where the, find the opportunity where it is. And well, yeah, and but, in these judicial states. Yeah. And certainly lenders want to go expand, but the, the real question is there's a cost to that. So of course the difference in an average rate of a private loan in California versus New York versus Indianapolis is pretty radical. I can tell you, can we see all the numbers? So you're talking about like 
hundreds of base points worth of oh, yeah. rate. And a big chunk of that, I think, is the um, speed and easiness and, and the ability to enforce and, and what leverage the borrower has if they decide not to pay. Um, but it, you know, ultimately, the consumers are, or the not consumers in this case, but the customers, the, the investors are paying the cost because there is a pretty significant difference. The markets differentiate the rates in those markets. So, what is fascinating though, Illinois, right? One of the larger, you know, attention states in the Midwest, the rates are coming down, right? And I think we're going to see the same thing in like Ohio and other states like that too. Yeah, so, they're coming down because yeah. they've been really high, but they're still yeah. between that and California, you're like a world. Oh, yeah. I mean, California, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Um, where rates, rates are only going to be going, if you're talking foreclosure rates, that's one thing, but rates no, no, we're talking about one interest. direction and they're going up right now. And, uh, you know, that's a good segue into the, 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 the discussion of your question, how interest rates are going to affect the, uh, the private lenders industry. You know, there's an old saying out there, don't fight the Fed, right? And we were talking about this in the beginning and the, the Fed was in and it made us all feel comfortable the last couple of years during the pandemic. And the federal government, for that matter, has done a good job. Everybody was liquid. Nobody went out of business. We were all panicked in March of 2020. But if you watch the Fed statement yesterday, the chairman and what he said, rates are going up. They're going to lower the Fed's balance sheet and there's going to be tapering going on. And what this means, there's no doubt, is John's rates are going to be going up like everybody else's. And if that's the case, then transactability in our space is going to slow. Things have become less affordable. And I've had this debate with a couple of uh, owners of some very large originators out there. And they say, no, 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 the housing shortfall isn't going away. But I agree with that. There's going to be a need for our space. But if the Fed is stepping away, you cannot fight the Fed. They're going to slow this economy. Our businesses will all slow if you make your money on transactions. What do you think about that, John? Uh, well, there's no, no, there's no doubt rates are going up. I, I, was, I was thinking about this recently. I've never been in my career uh, where I'm actually lending out money at lower the inflation rate. And, and that seems like a kind of bad idea. <laughs> if you step back and think about it, uh, you actually give your money out and someone pays you back. And assuming they pay you back, there's no delinquencies or anything. Uh, you actually get money back that's worth less even after your interest and what you're giving out. And, and when things like that happen with a 7% inflation rate, whatever it is right now, like that's not normal, that's not stable and that will adjust. And so that's why you're seeing the pressure on the Fed increase. They need to. I mean, I don't, I don't like it, but it was kind of. I think it has to happen. Right, I mean, we, right, we also right have to for the, for the, <laughs> It has to happen. Um, but it's inevitably going to happen. I think what's really relevant about the market is most lenders, a lot of lenders on this call, have actually shifted their business pretty radically over the last few years. So they have shifted away from bridge loans and still there's a ton of bridge loans, right? It's not like that's going away, but like. Uh, towards DSCR loans. And that product is, you know, a very profitable product for people to originate. You know, we bought a you know, billion dollars of that over the last year. Um, we're securitized when we're in the market we're for our th third securitization right now. Um, so we're, we're actively, actively purchasing and sort of financing that. But the point about that product, that product is 80% refi. So of the 100 DSCR loans we acquire, 80% <laughs> of those are refinancing something else. Oftentimes, the bridge loan. Now, bridge loans on the other side are almost all purchase, or not almost, a vast majority of bridge loans are purchase. So when you refi, I refinanced my own home mortgage at 2.5% last year. I'm not going to go take out a new loan and pay that off anytime. Uh, I'm never going to get that rate again for a long time. Um, same thing with all the borrowers. The borrowers have kind of hit it, right? And they've gone out and refied their loan, and they've gotten lower interest rate. So when you think about the impacts of higher interest rate, number one is that this product, which has become a pretty significant portion of our industry, is going gonna, it's gonna get hit this year. I mean, there's no way you cannot see that because rates are going up. Now, the only countering factor to that is that you know the share of the private lending industry of the entire investor universe is still small. The vast majority of this going to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are doing the vast majority of the loans in this space. So you know, the industry has the opportunity to increase its market share, but there's no doubt that the overall volume of investor loans, 30-year uh, loans are going down. So that's number one. So if you're a lender out there, if you're on this call and you have a significant reliance on that product, we love it. We're still buying it. But like the reality is the customers aren't going to take as much of it, you know, as rates go up. And that's a much more rate sensitive product than bridge loans. Um, so I think that's one thing we should be ready for. Number two is, um, well, what's happened, the flip side of that, the good news, is that the flip side of that is, you know, many investors in this space, like not 
us or lenders, but the actual people buying houses uh, have had trouble finding deals. I mean, they've been priced out of deal after deal. Margins are compressed for buyers of investor buyers of properties. You know, used to be able to get a 30, an average in our book is a 30% profit margin when you buy a deal. That's down, you know, to 20% an average if you can find a deal. So significant compression in the number of opportunities and the margin you have. That's because it's been such a massive uh, interest from homeowners wanting to go buy those exact same properties, which have been competing with investors and driving up the prices. So what happened, the good news is that what happens when rates go, go up, uh, probably the number of homeowners going to be buying houses is going to decrease uh, because the affordability is going down as their interest rates go up. Right. Uh, their ability to buy properties less. So that probably means there's more opportunity for the investor universe to come in and, you know, this is how markets work too. It's great. Come in and sort of find more property. So I think the volume of bridge loans actually ends up increasing as a result of this. Um, which are more of a purchase product, less of a refi product, they'll offset some of the you know, pressure we're going to see on DSCR over the course of next year. And then the third question is what happens to housing prices? So that's that's the that's the big one. Um, we have had a unprecedented in all of our lifetime growth in housing prices over the past year. Um, and to oversimplify this, the way my brain works, is three things that drive housing prices. Number one is interest rates. Interest rates are going up. Uh, that's going to make it less affordable. You know, it's extremely, you know, if you go up from a 3% to a 4.5% rate, you're talking about a 50% increase in your, your dollars you're actually paying, right? Um, so it's a very, very significant leverage, especially when you're starting off with these low interest rates because the percentage increases are very high. That's going to be a negative. But the other two things you have that are offsetting that are, uh, number one, you know, people make a lot of money. You know, it's hard to hire people right now. Employers have no leverage. Employees have all the leverage right now in this, in this economy. Um, so people get raises, they all have jobs, you, job, you pretty much have it now in this economy. So definitely the ability of people to afford and make a lot of money and be able to pay for housing is increasing. Um, and the second thing is, you kind of referred to this earlier, John, the, um, you know, still the uh, supply of housing is ridiculously low and, you know, almost no inventory. So, so those three things are kind of offsetting each other. I don't see a decline in housing prices, but we're not going to, it may be a slight increase over the course of next year, in my view but certainly not anything like what we've had in the past. So that means that people, you know, a lot of people who have kind of, I'd say come into the space over the last two years and think they're real geniuses because you've had uh, zero losses and zero delinquencies in a world where housing prices are going up. That's not a real test, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if yeah, you're losing right. money in the last year, you're a clown. <laughs> if you're if you haven't made money the last year, <laughs> you, you really should just get out of the business. But, but you know, the real test is going to be when people are in a flat environment and you know, credit standards have you know, definitely been pushed over the past couple of years. And what happens to you know, some of the newer entrants and their credit discipline and their underwriting when they actually get tested in a real market? So I think that's something that's uh, to be seen for the entire market. I mean, so just back to the, the interest rate topic, which is really going to be a, a big driver of uh, change over the next at least year, but likely longer than that. So the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, indicated that we're going to have a rate hike in March. Um, Jamie Dimon saying we're going to have anywhere from four to six rate hikes this year. Um, and I guess the, the question is really how aggressive the Fed becomes in, in raising interest rates is going to be the key driver of of how the, the DSCR product is impacted, as you were alluding to, John. Um, but I think just one thing, one key thing to look out for is that we might see, uh, so I guess a trend that we've seen at WeLend is that there's aggregators who are decreasing the DSCR ratio in order to get into the space and become more competitive. Right. So instead of doing a 1.25 DSCR, uh, there's lenders doing a 1.1. 1 .1, uh, there's aggregators doing a 1.1. 1 .1. uh, there's some aggregators going at a 1.0 DSCR. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I've heard of uh, aggregators buying at like 0.8 DSCR, which I'm not re able to really wrap my head around. Um, but I guess what I'm alluding to is the the Fed stepping into the market. It's just going to change the economics. It's going to change the way we do business. It's not necessarily going to have that dramatic of an impact of uh, 
slowing down the business to the point where where we feel it. I would hope. I, I, I disagree with that. Yeah. I disagree with that completely. The the Fed is not stepping into the market. They're stepping out of the market. They've been, think about the environment we've been in. They've pumped so much money into this economy that everybody on this phone call thinks they're flush, okay? And that they're really smart and successful. It was really hard to make a mistake with the Fed, which I call putting huge training wheels on our bicycle. And it was impossible for us to fall. They have now said they're removing those training wheels. And that's going to drive interest rates up, which are going to slow the economy. And if there's a slower economy, it means there's a less money out there. All the money has to burn off. And that's what's going to go to affordability on the housing market. So there is still a shortage. And there are a lot of metrics in place that make our space really strong still. And it may take a long time for the inventories to reset so that supply hits demand, which, which, which we could take advantage of the next couple of years. But as rates go up, John said it correctly, the less affordable each house is. Eventually, that's going to stop driving prices up, and they'll, they'll stabilize and maybe even fall at some point, not now, because, again, we're too flush. So by the Fed stepping out, it is going to slow the number of available deals for everybody on this call, which means it's going to become more competitive. And John's pricing, like everybody else's, is going to go up. He can't help it because, he, because as interest rates rise, there are alternative investments to our space that, that may be deemed safer, that people could go into. And that's going to be where the competition comes. Now, I have a question, uh, if I may ask. Um, John, there are a lot of aggregators who've entered our space over the last 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. Some have foreign money that are coming in and not domestic money. With the change, the rising interest rates, how many do you think stay in the space? How many leave the space and leave their trading partners abandoned? Like, what do you see happening in terms of consolidation on the aggregator side as interest rates rise, as the Fed steps away and slows our market? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I think you're going to have, well, I'll, I'll say historically, there, there's multiple different types of money. Uh, you know, money that owns you, that actually fully invests in you, where you have your own balance sheet like Torek has our balance sheet is over half a billion dollars. Our equity value like in the company is in excess of half a billion dollars. That's obviously the most stable. That money's not going anywhere. It's in our company. It's here. Um, a lot of people have built, we're kind of unusual actually. A lot of people have built businesses on uh, taking loans and they don't want to call themselves brokers, but they're effectively brokers. What they're doing is they're, they're taking loans, whether they're clear about it or not. They're selling loans uh, or packaging loans, selling loans to Japanese money, to Asian money. To other places and historically you know having been on wall street for a little while you know that kind of money ends up being very fickle or they get a sense that the housing markets can go down and that money you know quickly can go away and, and many times over many cycles that has gone away so i think you know the question that people don't ask enough actually when we work with them is well what where, where's your money coming from <laughs> like what, what what happens to your money how what what are the, what are the conditions where your money goes away because we feel like for us, it's very, very important to support our customers, you know, you know, through all, all time periods. So we have the ability to go securitize. We have the ability, we have bank lines, we can find, fund ourselves in bank lines. Uh, we also have our, our parent company, you know, great thing about being owned by KKR, uh, they can go out and buy a hundred billion dollar life insurance company. So <laughs> they also own a major life insurance company so we can feed loans into the life insurance company. So there's the amount of alternatives that we have to go to have a diversified capital structure and be able to deal with kind of all different market environments is, is a lot better than someone who effectively is taking your loans, just selling them on. In many cases to us, it's, it's so fascinating. We end, we end up at the, owning a lot of the loans that come through other sources because we end up buying them ourselves. But it's, um, yeah, I, I think really understand where, not where, who you're talking to, but where their money's coming from, whether they actually control it and what's likely to happen to that is something that people should really think about. It, there will be people stepping away from the market with what's going to happen, which will make again, funds um, more pricey for us. The, 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 the competition will slow. It's just the natural effect. It's not going to keep going. So uh, like I, I like to give our audience a little bit of credit in the, sense, in the sense that they kind of prepared for this after 2020. I mean, like a lot of people built their contingency plans. Some didn't, granted, right? And I think uh, a lot of them started to you know, be a little more thoughtful about uh, how to prepare for a down cycle in 2020, at least a little bit of a stress test. And I, and I would encourage our audience to think about, you know, with 
with the, we have some time, right? Because this is this impact is going to be gradual, and start thinking about your contingency plan. Start start thinking about alternative solutions, whether it be a new aggregator relationship or a more stable aggregator relationship, or personally yourself for your business and and thinking about having your own balance sheet or whatever have you. That's going to be important. Solidifying your banking relationships, your, your credit line relationship, making sure that you're in a good position. So that if if we if you are faced with a you know, internal crisis, uh, whether it's because you know you've taken on too much risk or because we're all facing that pain point, uh, you are prepared to some degree, so you're not having to suffer uh, dramatically like a lot of folks did back in 2020. So, so Kevin, I'll, I'll throw the, the question about interest rates to you and just yeah. get perspective on it. I mean, it's it's funny. I'm not I'm not a macro economist. I'm not an economist. I'm I'm an attorney. You know, I'm not, I I did I did. I'm not a specialist when it comes to this. But like I I view this. I see, I've kind of prepared for this meeting, and I was kind of looking at the different viewpoints, right? And there's there's the there's the really doom and gloom type personalities out there, like Jeremy Grantham was saying, the world is going to end, right? And I don't. I think that's a little bit too draconian, right? I think a lot of us have scars from 2008, and and we're kind of been trained that way. I do think that uh, with the increase in rates combined, and this is the most important part, combined with uh, less loose monetary policy, right? Less loose is the key thing, right? Not tight monetary policy, but less loose because the, the Biden administration was unable to pass Build Back Better. It's unlikely we're going to see continued stimulus and free money basically being poured into the market. So as that as that tapers backwards and and we're starting to see a little more tightening, I think that you'll probably will probably have to play it as it as it rolls out, right? And so the Fed will likely have to make a decision after the first or second rate hike. Okay, well let's see how this plays out and see what we have to do. Now, granted, there are other factors that are completely unrelated, right? So, but have an impact on the the value of goods and impacts us on the downstream and. And that has a lot to do with, you know, this, this supply chain challenge that we're having right now. So it all ties together. But I, I like the idea of let, let's see how this plays out when we see the first two rate hikes combined with tightening of monetary policy will likely have some positive effect uh, to reduce inflation. Uh, we are going to have to tighten our belts. It's going to have to happen. We're going to have to be more disciplined. But I don't think we're going to see like I don't think it's as, as draconian as you know, investors like Grantham have put it, or other people are like, oh, the party's over. I don't know if the party's over just quite yet, but I think we have to be a little more conservative, right? Like, no, the party's not over. You're gonna have, yeah. but, you're, but only, only you're doing instead of, to instead of taking that beer bong out, right? That's, that's basically okay, what okay, I'm saying. Yeah, compared right? to last year, the party's over. Okay, last year was a whack, you know, great year. That's you know going to go down the annals. It's kind of in our history, right? As a as a real peak year. Um, that being said, you have headwinds. Rates are higher. Borrowers don't yeah. want to borrow money. Rates are higher. You know, housing prices are not going to be growing at the same rate they've been growing in the past, or you know, hopefully they don't decline. But that's you, you have that dynamic, and you clearly have uh, you know the major product you know in the industry is going to be extremely challenged. It's not extremely, but it's mm -hmm. much more challenged last year, this year. So it's not going to be as easy to make money this year as it was last year. Yeah, it worked a lot harder. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Like we still have a great business and everything's fine, but like it's just not going to be as uh, I think it's pretty obviously not going to be as good. And I think a lot of people. You know, even not me, I'm thinking about this. Like I've never really been in a rate environment where you have the potential for rates to go as high as quickly as possible. Like as short and as rapidly as what we're seeing right now. Um, you know, once again- The last time was in the eighties, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's been yeah. a long, long time. Yeah. And we are talking about a 7% interest rate guys where like short-term rates are less than one. So there is a, and, we're, and, and by the way, the people are most conservative are saying there's going to be like you know a point and a half of you know six increases a quarter point, one point five percent. You're still at two percent. You're still like literally a massive fraction of what the inflation rate is. That's not sustainable. Okay, ultimately interest rates are supposed to be higher than inflation. Ultimately savers are supposed to be rewarded for saving, not punished, which is what's happening right now. And that's not a normal thing that we're avert. So the real question is going to be. This is why people talk about supply chain. Why people you know various things, but like. Is the inflation rate going to stay as high as it is? Right. If it stays as high as it is, there is no doubt rates are going up a lot higher and a lot faster than everyone's expecting. But don't you think that it has to do partially with monetary policy? Right. If they tighten monetary policy, will we see a, 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 you know inflation become transitory? I, I like that argument because like 
I, I don't think we're seeing enough to argue for doom and gloom, right? Like the eighties are back and like, you know, gas lines and bread lines. No, and I, I think, I, I think in general, we're, we're in an unknown period. And the fed chairman said the best thing on Wednesday. And, and I think Kevin repeated it. We're going to uh, raise interest, interest short-term up in March. April rain going to begin. It's going to go up again in April. And then we're going to wait and see what happens. Right. All the smart people are saying that inflation is not the first time we're going to see a break in inflation, maybe fourth quarter this year, if not rolled the next year. So, you know, with inflation high and, and the supply chain, which they thought was going to iron out very quickly, is not going to iron out that quickly. We're going to still feel the pain from every product you want to get between now until next year. And the supply chain problems is a feeder to inflation. So, you know, you can't pump trillions of dollars into an economy and think there's no effect. There is an effect. And we have to now get rid of what happened. And the good news about it is, is I think we have the right chairman, Chairman Powell, at the right time. He's not just looking at the stock market, which is going to cause a lot of pain to a lot of people. He has clearly said he's focusing on bringing the inflation rate down to the target of 2%. It's at 7%, 8%. It's way too high. Right. You know, I don't, I don't know if... Um... People are aware of this, but you know I, I track uh, a lot of things, and, and there's something called the M2 money supply. And the uh, you remember from economics class in college, whatever the M2 money supply is basically the you know a calculation of the amount of currency and money and deposits and things that are in circulation. Um, and when you print a lot of money and when you do things like we've been doing over the past year and a half or two years, that money supply goes up a lot. On Mar I'm just looking at it right now, and if, if you guys can Google St. Louis Federal Reserve publishes data. On March 2nd, 2020, the total money supply in the United States was $15.5 trillion, $15.5 trillion, okay? Today, I'm trying to get the exact, January 3rd is close enough, $22 trillion. So the amount of money in the economy has gone from $15.5 trillion to $22 trillion. But if you look at this chart over, you know, it goes back to the early 80s, there is no period where the amount of growth in the money supply has been anywhere close to what we've experienced over the past few years. It, it really is. I, I think people just talk about the Fed, what's happening. The amount of, so every $15 if you have in your wallet, you know, on March 2nd, 2019, uh, 2020, before this thing's happened, there's been another whatever, like, you know, $8 or $6, $6 or $7, whatever it is, you know, a significant amount of additional money has been printed and it's floating around the economy. So when that happens, what happens? People buy stuff. Lots of demand, everyone filling up restaurants, you know, especially when you can't leave your house because of COVID. And so all this amount of stuff is pent up in the economy. Stock market's gone up a ton, you know, and people have had an easy time. This is not normal, right? This no doubt the past two years is not normal. We're going to a totally different world. And the in the the scale of what's happened, I think people don't really fully comprehend. When you look at the money supply numbers, it's pretty yeah. There is, there is going to be, I agree with John 100%, there's going to be a cost to unwinding what was done. And I believe what was done was necessary. No, I don't think there were mistakes made. I think the fact that we're having this call today and we're all positive about our businesses going forward is tremendous about our industry. I don't think there's a country that handled COVID better than us in terms of our economy. Both the federal government stepping up with their stimulus as well as the Fed which whose balance sheet ballooned to $9 trillion. $9 trillion is on the Fed's balance sheet right now. Our local economy, our United States gross national product is $24 trillion. The Fed is at $9 trillion. That has to be unwound. That has to go back to get to normalcy. And it's going to be pain. You know, you say the party's over. The, we got to get a little bit of our hangover now and come back to reality and reset. The good news is our industry has matured to the fact that it will survive this downturn. If this happened seven years ago, it wouldn't be. This because it wasn't an accepted asset class to invest in. It is now. It will be some consolidation. Some players will step away. Some players won't make it. But we're in, in, in the end, we're all, all the people on this call are going to be here for the next rise up, which will be in the future. Yeah, and one, one more thing I'll say for really for the lenders in the call who haven't been through a rising rate environment, you gotta you know, think about that and think about what that means for your business. So if you're giving out a 30 year loan at a certain rate and that if you're not you know, hedge or something, which you're not, 
And that interest rates in that, you know, two months, it takes you a month or whatever it takes you to close that loan, go up a lot. That loan's going to be less valuable when you sell it versus when you ultimately made the loan. And the opposite of that's happened over the past two years, right? Some people have seen like this declining rate environment, you have to pay more, whatever. It's, it's the issue hasn't really, it's been the opposite. But when rates go up, you got to be careful as a lender. You don't get held with inventory. You want to be selling your loans quickly. You want to make sure you're partnering with someone like us. We hedge, we, we can do swaps and futures and that. We have a whole business of dealing with this, but as a lender, the last thing we want is to see people making loans at a lower interest rate. You know, having the Federal Reserve announce they're about to raise interest rates a bunch of times, and then that loan is not worth as much as it was for us. So you got to be prepared for that and manage your business differently in a rising rate environment than doing a falling rate environment. I would hope that the Fed indicates when they're going to do interest rates uh, with enough time where uh, the market will be will have time to react. March. Yeah, they've, they've already announced it. It's like, already baked. In, it's being baked in now. It's it's the rates are the from the latest bond yields. It's baked in five uh, ten year treasury rates. It's it's baked in five uh, raises already. So you're seeing it uh, uh, in the ten year bond yield. So it, it's it's known. It hasn't transferred to our space yet. Meaning. John's point was people are sitting there out there, you know, they're getting pissed if he's raising uh, any of his buy rates uh, on the 30 year, but so they're, they are going up. <laughs> they're, they're not going down. I mean, we're telling you that the short term rates going up, the Fed is tapering, it has to go up, his costs are going up, but that has to translate on the front lines. And to his point, all those people who did all these refinancings, which were a huge portion of everybody's business over the last year, are going to go, wait a minute, that's too expensive. It's not worth it to me to refinance anymore. And that's part of the business is going to slow. John, when you mentioned uh, Bridge as being a bigger product for the next 12 months, and I agree with you, are you saying Bridge with a construction component or not? And does that depend on whether foreclosures loosen up or not in your mind? Well, I, I think I think both actually. I think all bridge is going to do a lot better this year than it has. I mean, last year's a fun year, but like I think you have a lot of positive tailwinds behind the bridge market. Um, you know, there has been. I'll tell you, in our book, we have a lot of New York, New Jersey loans. I just, you know, New Jersey foreclosures are going through. Uh, it's actually like sales being scheduled and processes are going. It's through. starting now. Yes. Uh, in New York, just uh, you can have a lot allowed the moratorium to lapse on January fifteenth. I'll tell you, a lot of borrowers who weren't really interested in talking to Torac. Uh, ended up uh, picking up the phone and calling us and, uh, and the, you know, a couple of days afterwards because it, yeah, they have to deal with it now. And there's actually, you know, we have to go work it out. And they literally, some people just want to pick up the phone, um, but nothing like actually some timeline to sort of get things going. That's all helpful because a lot of these properties are, are sort of empty. There's no one living in them. They're not being renovated. Um, they're just, you know, depreciating. It's not, it's not good for anyone, honestly, to have all these, you know, vacant foreclosure properties sitting around for a long time. They blight neighborhoods sometimes, and, and it's just no one wins from this whole thing. So that's helpful. That's going to help drive, especially in the Northeast, where the areas where we've had these sort of moratoriums, some, some amount of transaction volume. That being said, these states are so slow. You know this, John. I mean, so slow to get a foreclosure done, even in good times, that it's not going to be like overnight. It's going to take a long time. The courts are slow, that the processes the, to get through this inventory of things. That's going to help a little bit, especially in those states. But I think more importantly, the biggest... But I said it before, I'll repeat, the biggest reason why bridge loans haven't been as prevalent is because you go to a, uh, you know, I mean, we see it in everyone's neighborhood. You try and buy something, it's sold in two days. And, and 20 owner occupiers want to go buy that property and there's bidding wars and the price go up and up and up. And so the ability, you know, investors need the ability to buy a property at a discount and sort of make a profit on it. I mean, that's kind of what they do. They buy it, they renovate it, and they sell it for more than what they, what they got it for or they rent it out. You know, I think when the, you know, the owner occupiers, you know, probably are going to have less demand than they did last year because of rates. Um, that's probably going to lead to less competition for investors. Therefore, there's more opportunity for investors to find deals. So I think that's the reason why I'm pretty optimistic about the bridge business this year um, as an offset to DSCR. Um, so I'll, I'll use that as a segue. Um, I think everyone kind of touched on this topic briefly, but I just feel like it's a, it's a good way to kind of just sum things up. Um, so in terms of predictions for the private lending industry this year, uh, Kevin, I'll throw it to you first. You know, you know, the big predictions, it's hard, it's hard to really, you know, 
break out a crystal ball when we have a little bit of this like let's try with, with monetary policy changes right let's try this out but i think john's right when it comes to housing prices we're going to start seeing some uh activity there uh but i think you know the industry has uh, the big prediction that i kind of have is the continued i guess uh maturity and sophistication of the marketplace right i think that's going to continue i think we're going to see a lot um of great products coming out new ideas coming out new ways to manage the business that are incredibly sophisticated but also like adoption of things that are you know that, are, that haven't been haven't been done yet right and and maybe some new asset classes that exist and also um you know one of the things that is becoming a, a new conversation center lately is the implementation of digitization and web 3.0 into the space and using a minimum it's just we're like we're like we're light years behind of where where a lot of the tech industry is but like adoption of blockchain technology and digitization uh, on the securization markets but also on loan servicing i think that's something we're going to see this year um and then the last part is as resident a lot for a long time our industry we had a lot of people who would do some commercial uh, real estate uh lending and i think we're going to start to see a little bit more attention being paid to that uh, we're already starting to see a little bit of attention a little more a lot more attention being paid to multifamily and so uh, a lot more clients are starting the conversation with me about like you know commercial is starting to make sense again and, and i'd like to start looking at it and uh and i've spoken with some of our uh friends in the space who are you know on the buy side and they're interested in buying it as well so i think that's that's gonna uh, start making its uh, way back to the private lending industry at large um not in, not in like a massive way in any, any way shape or form but i think it's going to be coming to us um and then and then the last part is you know uh, not necessarily like a lot of mass exodus but i think you know one of the things that we need to be ready for is that that, that, that tightening of the belt right i think we're going to see um a little bit more discipline onto the space uh come 20 come 22 and and continue into 23 so uh, yeah no i think that's actually <laughs> you, you made several really good points um one in particular is that Look, there's new products that are emerging we're seeing so like airbnb lending like that's becoming pretty popular right. um like build for rent communities uh like obviously like whole communities like whole communities it's crazy yeah, yeah. precisely um so while I, I in my opinion uh while certain products may get affected uh but by interest rates or what what have you other market factors um i think that we would see some sort of shift and we're seeing this shift already to uh investors coming to us and saying hey like we just bought this 16 unit we're turning it into an airbnb uh lend on it I, like that's just one sort of example of how airbnbs adus like other types of long-term long-term financing like this all types of innovation is going to happen it's as as it should right and, and i love the fact that we can do that now with sophistication as opposed to kind of like come up with some crazy idea and see if it works right so that's where i think that's that's the difference maker from today to looking back to 2012 when you had all types of different you know hairbrained ideas some penciled some didn't right so <laughs> well said um John Beecham, uh, your predictions for the private lending industry for this year? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, it's so, so fascinating. Like all these products were sort of rolled out, right? And so then they get percolated throughout the industry. So I guess we have a little bit of an inside track and sort of what's going to happen next. But, um, you know, we're, we're doing, we did launch Airbnb last uh, September. Um, and now it's a significant portion of our DSCR business. Um, for this year, I think uh, you're going to see changes in valuations. I think our valuation system in this country is broken. Our average age of an appraiser in this country is over 55. And the rules to become a new appraiser are so onerous, honestly, no one's joining the, very few people are joining the industry. Uh, rates are high, turn times are low. And uh, especially when you've had this refi boom that's gone on in the resi world, which sucked up appraisal resources away from private lending. You know, the service level that private lending depends upon to really give good uh, quality, quick closings to the customers. Mm -hmm. Has really been eroded over the past uh, over the past year, so I think there's going to be pressure on, and we're we're we've developed and we'll continue to develop sort of other creative alternative valuation products. Um, they're not necessarily a full interior appraisal, but still give in many cases we think better uh, actual valuation accuracy. 
but allows for a quicker, you know, more rapid close for the lender um, than they've seen in the past. I think that's something that I, I, I know we'll be over this year because we're, you know, we're, we're at the forefront of that. Um, so that's one thing I think we'll develop. I think you'll see uh, some of the new entrants kind of back off. Um, uh, I think, you know, rising rates, you know, nothing like a little bit of a, you know, stable housing environment to sort of reveal credit deficiencies and delinquencies and things that people haven't had to deal with over the past year. So I think you'll definitely see some of that as well. Um, I think you'll see, you know, the good lenders continue to grow. I mean, it's a great business. Uh, our products are cheap, are much cheaper than they've been in the past, which is good. That means the service level and the value proposition we're giving to the borrowers in this industry have improved a lot, which means our market share of private lending as a whole, the lending market will continue to increase. Um, we also see a lot of opportunity in multifamily. Um, we have put a lot of resources into multifamily that's you know, already, you know, you know, 30% of our business or something and, and growing. And so we think that will grow as a percentage of our, our business over the next year as well. So generally, I think I think this year will be a, a good solid year for people, not as good as by, by comparison to last year, you know, not as strong, but still a uh, still a good opportunity for people to do well. And, and if you're disciplined, focused on credit uh, and, and really focus on long-term lenders will do well. And Mr. Hornick, last but not least. Uh, I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I want to thank Andrew and Whelan for uh, having a um, uh, speaker today. Uh, look, the, the whole talk was about where we think we're going. Um, I think it's going to get, uh, we're, we're going to enter rough waters. Uh, there are five factors that I think affects that. First, we talked about the Fed, Fed stepping away from the marketplace. Uh, we haven't spoken a lot about it, but the midterm election and uh, the whole house is up and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Senate seats and control is gonna be up. So you're gonna have uh, nothing moving in Washington in terms of fiscal contributions to Americans. So that's gonna hurt us as well. You still have COVID out there, although I think that's moved away. Uh, that's an unknown. Um, I think a lot of the things that are, are more unknown is Russia moving into the Ukraine, how we respond, China maybe doing something with Taiwan, all of this will affect national policy and movements in our economy. And there's a lot of unknown there. Assuming everything else is stable, I think it, it's going to get a little ugly for us uh, in terms of uh, transactional volume and, and deals that can be done. Uh, by no means is our space done. I just think we're going to have to tighten our belts and be smart about the type of deals we do, how we underwrite, and uh, who we do business with. A um, couple things. Um, I mean, we talk about new products. We, we've developed an option product where lenders actually buy properties and give options back to uh, lenders who pay them a fee. Uh, this takes care of credit issues for borrowers, uh, FICO scores, and uh, the lender is actually the owner of the property. So it's something that in a negative um, environment where, where credit scores are dropping, it allows transactions to go through. And we've had a lot of interest recently developing uh, lenders who want to lend into people buying out of foreclosures and auction products. So how to buy out of the auction itself and how to fund the foreclosure. I have one lender who will take the foreclosure over, lend against it, not buy it, lend against it. So new products are coming. Um, from a technological standpoint, we are going to go to a full electronic and remote online notarization at some point. I think it's going to be this year. Um, Long we, overdue. We, we've discussed working with Torac with that as well as some other originators. It's really moving the, the, the credit providers, the warehouse lenders to get comfortable with it. But we're going to be able to close uh, loans, all remote online notarization, all from one spot. And that's where the space should be. Um, and the fact that it's not with the technology that we have today is wrong. It just has to catch up. But uh, you know we're we're a private lender law. We're busy developing all this stuff, and uh, I think it's close to being rolled out. So I'm excited for what the future brings. Um, unfortunately, um, you know I, I love being bullish, but in this at this time uh, I'm I'm a little bearish based on what I'm seeing out there. Not that any not that it's it's catastrophic by any means. It's not 2007, but um, you got to be smart. Well said. I think I think we all have slightly different perspectives. Um, 
I think that as uh, Kevin alluded to earlier, I, people are scarred by 07, 08, and we're, we're kind of getting uh, flashbacks of it. But at the end of the day, today's market is significant, significantly different. Uh, the fundamentals are significantly different. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act has been in place for a long time. That's led a lot of stability on the, uh, the residential regulated side. Um, and we don't have the same sort of uh, the issues involved with that time. Um, but it, it, again, I just uh, I think it's just my my spin on it. Um, so I, I guess with that being said, uh, let's, we'll start to wrap up. Uh, so I just want to thank all our panelists today for, for joining. Uh, John Beecham, Turak, Jonathan Hornick from Private Lender Law and Kevin Kim from Jurassi. Uh, we greatly appreciate having you guys on and we, uh, we look forward to the next webinar. Thanks guys. Thank you.